So we're right doing this, but here we go. It's the tune, but it's the afternoon. Uh, <laughs> so good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, it's wicked to have you here, and like I can already see uh, Dubai, Glasgow, London, Singapore, Singapore, Kansas City. God, this is mad. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's wicked to have you all here. Thank you all so so much for taking the time. Um, as you can see in the chat feature, people are taking the time to uh, to say where they're watching from. So do pop in the chat who you are, where you're watching from, uh, whether it's been sunny near you, it's been sunny near us, and uh, you know uh, how you are today as well. Uh, the best way you're going to be able to do that as well, by the way, uh, is you'll see in the chat feature that says uh, two, and then it's got like a little blue bit that presently says uh, two panelists for most of you. Uh, if you click that and switch it to panelists and attendees, everyone can see what you're saying uh, rather than just uh, Emma and I. Um, and that will be a nice way for you to interact with everyone throughout the course of the session. Uh, so. I'm going to repeat the same as what we uh, said last week, because I think this is a really nice measure of success for the next hour or so. Uh, I think there's three ways that we make today successful. Uh, the first thing is that you come away with a new idea or having learned something new. And Emma and I are going to be working really, really hard to make that happen for you. Uh, the second way that this is, uh, this is a success today is that chat feature that is presently pinging away like anything, <laughs> stays alive for the duration of today's session and that like it just doesn't stop for the entire time. And let me re-emphasize, uh, it needs to go into panelists and attendees because there's always a few, there's always a few who just stay on panelists and, uh, and it's a lovely thing to see your messages, but I want everyone to see uh, who you are and, and what you got to say. And then the third way uh, today remains uh, or becomes a success is that you share the session. Uh, so we're on Instagram, we're on uh, Twitter and we're on LinkedIn. Um, this isn't me asking you to do my marketing for me or anything like that. Uh, this community has been set up for your benefit. Hopefully, hopefully you're walking away with having learned something new, having met someone new, had the opportunity to just engage in something you wouldn't otherwise and it'd be really 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 appreciated if you can help bring other people into this community uh, so they're able to benefit from it as well so uh today we have the absolute pleasure of welcoming uh the supremely competent the absolutely wonderful and uh my good friend uh emma honeybone to speak with us today um <laughs> Emma is the Head of Relationship Marketing at Engine Group. And actually, I'm going to make this introduction nice and short because she's actually the first ever returning speaker for one of our Marketing Meetup webinars. Am I really? Yeah. Which oh, is I love mental, that. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it is nearly a year since, isn't it? I know. So Emma was actually, you were the eighth uh, Marketing Meetup webinar uh, host um, slash presenter and I think we've gone on to do something like 50 something over the past year or so now mm. which is mental um, Emma 
as I said, is the head of relationship marketing at Engine Group. Uh, they represent people like Coca-Cola, Under Armour, Sky, Domino's, the REF, Unilever, and many, many more. They're very impressive. That's what you <laughs> Uh, and Emma herself has been on an incredible marketing journey throughout her career, uh, starting at BT. She's held a number of marketing roles. And today she's responsible for all the fun stuff. <laughs> it's so true. <laughs> I love that. That's a direct quote. <laughs> I've got the, I the best that. job at Engine, seriously. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, this is going to be good fun, I can tell you. <laughs> um, and as I say, on a personal level, um, Emma, Emma was actually uh, the only, not that I was expecting it, but was the only marketing meetup speaker to actually send a card when Annie was born, uh, my, my daughter as well, which is uh, a measure both of her as a human being, but also just the effortless way that she seems to go through life. Um, today's session will run as a presentation and then a Q&A. And what you'll find is the Q&A function down below. Uh, so if you wiggle your mouse, uh, you'll be able to see that there will be a little toolbar that appears and you'll be able to find the Q&A section there. So uh, do get your questions in throughout the session. Uh, it's really, really important that we answer your questions to make this as relevant as we can for you. Um, before I hand over to Emma, it's important to do one last thing, which is to thank our sponsors. Uh, and I do this every week and it's a really, really important part of everything we do because a lot of people will turn off at the sponsor stage and go, oh, God, we've got to listen to that bit. But these are part of our DNA. These are people who have said to our community that we're going to support you. And it's really well deserved that they sort of get a moment to sort of say thank you to them. Mm -hmm. And every week we highlight one sponsor. And this week, that's Third Light. Third Light are a software company based uh, about 10 minutes down the road from me. And the thing that I can say about them is that throughout the entire duration of our in time interacting as the marketing meetup community with Third Light, they've treated me and the marketing meetup as nothing but family. They are a group of incredible human beings. The thing that they do is they do uh, database asset management. So for anyone who actually spends any time sort of thinking, where the hell are my files? Or <laughs> collaborate better internally, then these are the people that you need to be going to. They work with people like the Royal Albert Hall, Roma FC, uh, a ridiculous um, client list from from water beach uh, over in, wow. in cambridge which is ridiculous um i also need to thank uh geosk impression content cal pitch fiverr redgate cambridge martin college brand gravity global uh and third light as well so you get them in the follow-up email please please just say thank you to them just to say thank you for your contributions thank you for allowing us to keep on doing what we're doing and so uh, that's me done. Uh, and it's Emma, it's over to you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for taking the time. I didn't get the time to say thank you before we came on. So I appreciate it. It is a pleasure. <laughs> it really is. Right. Can everybody see my screen? Joe, uh, you give me the thumbs up because I can't see the chat anymore. Now I'm in. So we can see your screen, but it's uh, doing the same as what it was doing before. Uh, Let's just stop it and do it again. Okay. Doesn't like it, does it? <laughs> So we, we usually go through a testing period. There we go. That works. Right. Good. Um, just touching on what um, Joe just said, this isn't in my presentation, but it was just a reminder. Um, relationships are interesting, aren't they? Because we often think about relationships in marketing in terms of customers. And that sponsor relationship is critical. If Joe didn't maintain those relationships, we wouldn't have this community. So you know, just saying thank you to someone seems really small, but it can have such a big impact in the work that we do. So big thank you to our sponsors. You allow us to be here and talking to each other. So hello, Emma Honeybone. Uh, that's me quite recently. Um, my hair continues to be out of control and I've yet to book um, a lockdown, a post-lockdown hair appointment. Um, but I, I'm told we're coming out of lockdown and at some point some normality might come to bear and we might even meet face to face at some point imagine that gosh I can't wait um, but today I'm here to talk to you about relationship marketing which is uh, not only my job but I think it's also my passion you know I genuinely love what I do I'm very very lucky to have a job that don't get me wrong has moments of great stress but it's just really really enjoyable so um, a little bit about me jo Joe's kind of done a beautiful intro as he always does 
Um, I describe myself as a classic marketer, and I do that for a reason, because um, that's not the way everybody comes into marketing anymore. But when I started a long time ago, if you wanted to get into marketing, you know, you went, you did a marketing degree and you, you, you basically worked your way up the ranks and there's no right or wrong way to get into a job. We all learn our skills in different ways, but I very much see myself as a classic marketer. Um, I started as a graduate at BT, had the opportunity to experience all different types of, um, of projects within that, consumer, government, B2B, even worked in a spin-off where we were given some money to create a startup in that period when um, we were all about um, creating dot-com organizations. That's how old I am. Um, and it just gave me an insight into different places that I might like to work. And for me, it just, it was B2B, you know, that became the area that I liked the most. So um, BT, then worked for O2, worked for another startup, had a baby, decided I didn't want to just sit at home. So I published a, a magazine for families and, and edited and distributed and got the sponsorship for that. Um, then I did some freelancing for about five years where I started working for Engine. And five years ago, last week, I was reminded by my um, brilliant people team, um, I celebrated my five year anniversary, basically, at Engine, which has gone by in the blink of an eye. I was sure it was about two years. Um, so broad career, mainly B2B, um, a long career. So if you want to tap me up for some advice after this presentation, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, but I'm also really passionate about the culture of an organization. I'm very lucky to work for Engine where they believe in, in the people who work in that organization. And it's our job to drive the culture. It's not top down. It's very much about individuals. So I'm a mental health champion because I've suffered quite severely with depression in the past. Um, and I'm also a diversity lead for the elderly of advertising because I'm now in that age bracket of basically being an outlier in my organization. Apparently I'm not because 15 other people contacted me and said, I'm in that age bracket, can I join the, the network? So we're there to basically drive change and make sure everybody's represented. So that's a little bit about me, which hopefully um, sets a tone for who I am and what I, I might talk about. Um, so today, Joe's asked me to come in and talk to you about relationship marketing. So what I thought I'd do is give you some, um, some of my thoughts about what I think it is, and then share a few tools with you that I use that I'm hoping you can take back into your roles um, and use within your jobs, um, because I certainly find them really useful. Um, and one of the things I've said to Joe in the past is, it's even if you've been doing a job for years and years, actually having process and actually having um, a, an approach to what you do means that you don't forget things. You know, Joe and I shared some stories before we came in of we've been doing events forever and we still forget things. So if you don't have some sort of process, then it's very easy to, to think you've done it because you've, you've been um, doing the same thing over and over again. So uh, up until about two years ago, I was head of marketing for one of the three pillars that make up Engine, as, as Joe said, Engine. Um, we're we're a, basically a, a marketing um, organization, but we do everything from um, data, consulting, research, advertising, influencer marketing, and that we're split into three pillars. And I was head of marketing for one of those pillars. And our CEO noticed what I was doing around what I didn't realize was relationship marketing. I was just doing my job and said, I really like that. Can you bring it out of the pillar and let's do it at group level? So that was two years ago. And I then thought, I best go and learn what relationship marketing is, because apparently I'm now head of it. And Joe mentioned it's the fun stuff. Um, but really, uh, if you think about relationship marketing and you Google it, you'll, you'll get a whole bunch of descriptions. Um, the definitions typically will include these terms, retention, um, customer loyalty, repeat business, uh, long term interaction, engagement. They're all valid. They all describe aspects of the approach. It's absolutely about long term, but it's also about short term. It's absolutely about retention, but it's also about growth. Interaction and engagement are key. Um, it can drive loyalty, but it's not always loyalty about customers. So customer loyalty is one aspect, but loyalty is much bigger. We talked about um, sponsors at the beginning of this talk. For me, it's basically, it, it's, it's a way to provide opportunities to connect and engage with people. It's that simple. You know, my job is to, 
to give those people who are out there winning business for our organization a means of engaging with potential clients, a means of engaging with existing clients and, and re reinforcing the fact that they're with Engine for the right reasons. But it's also a little bit broader than that. Um, so for me, it's inclusive. It's not exclusive. And I have worked in organizations in the past where you'd put on an event, it'd only be for a really small number of people. They're always C-suites. You know, it's always the, the, the people who haven't got the time to come. That's the other thing. So you work your ass off trying to get these people to an event as much as they'd love to. You know, their diaries are booked up three months in advance. So for me, it's don't get me wrong. Occasionally it is an elite sport. If you want to do a round table where you want to talk about, you know, what's the strategy for uh, financial services organizations in the 20 first century, then you're probably going to want to get some CEOs, um, some C-suite members around a table to discuss that. But in the main, your relationship marketing program should think about the full breadth of contacts in your organization. So think about all the connections that contribute to your business. So even in our business, we have people who go and work client side. So we we decide we're going to do a project. We, we win the business. We're very lucky, very happy about that. We send people to deliver that project and they work side by side with the client team. That's one of our main approaches is we don't we don't sit remotely if, um, if there's an opportunity for us to work together. Those people are often quite junior, but they're having conversations every day with that client that brings us information that we wouldn't get if we went and spoke to the CMO or we went and spoke to the, you know, the director of, um, of customer. So think about all the connections that are going on within your organization when you start thinking about your relationship marketing program. Um, I'm just going to give you a little example of something I'm doing at the moment. So tomorrow, uh, I was just saying to Joe, uh, I've got an event tomorrow. We've, like Joe, you know, we've got uh, close to a thousand people register to, to attend the event. So pretty big numbers. Uh, Matthew Syed's coming in to talk to us about his book, uh, Rebel Ideas, The Power of Diverse Thinking. If you haven't read it, seriously go and read it. Whatever stage of your career you are in, this is going to change the way you interact. It's going to change the way you plan projects. It's absolutely groundbreaking. Um, so Matthew is an author. He's also a journalist for The Times. For 10 years, he was the number one table tennis player for the UK and went to two Olympics. I mean, is there anything the man can't do? Um, but this event, really great speaker, uh, absolute A-list in terms of, of our customer base. So we've offered it out to existing clients, potential leads, intermediaries, media contacts, all the people you would think about um, as being the key contacts for your organization. But because we're doing it by Zoom, the joy of the Zoom culture, it means you've got more spaces. We've actually been able to offer it across the base of our organization. So we've been able to say to our HR teams, do you wanna send it out to recruitment companies that we work with? Would you like to share it with um, a graduate base who are maybe thinking about joining us um, next year? So it, it's just given us more potential to build relationships that aren't just about those people who are gonna sign on the dotted line, um, but they might be influencers, they might be shapers. Um, and also the, the, one of the key things for me is that where you can, don't always offer things to the most senior people in the business. If you can offer it to a number of people in that organization and get them to come collectively even better because that way they'll go away and they'll talk about it afterwards and, and that will keep your business front of mind uh, much longer. So that's an example of one I'm doing tomorrow where I could quite easily have said, this is only for our prime um, C-suite targets, but we've offered it much wider and, and the business loves us for that because it's something they can share with contacts that they've got. Um, so this is a couple of tools I thought I'd share with you of things that I do that you might find quite useful. Um, I hope you do. So when you're thinking about the role that relationship marketing can play in your business, that way of creating opportunities for people to connect with people, um, who do you want to have conversations with and why? That's the first question. So you automatically go to sales and business development, whether you're in B2C or B2B, you're automatically thinking, right, how are we going to retain and grow our business? Who are the buyers? Who are the stakeholders? Who are the influencers? And you know that the purpose of that is lead generation, pipeline development, showcasing who you are, um, reinforcing the value of them working with you. For me, it also adds value 
to the individual and the organization. You know, we bring in people like Matthew Syed, we've brought in Jason Fox. Uh, we bring that in because it gives people something inspirational to listen to. There's no direct sale for engine off the back of that, but we like bringing in smart people with smart ideas who can basically motivate the people we work with. And, and they, you know, for us, it's curating really interesting content for that audience. Marketing, again, probably quite obvious, you know, who are our suppliers or our sponsors? Who are the press contacts we want to work with? What forums, networks, community groups are we working with? We want to make sure that they keep us up to date with what's going on in their part of the world. And we want to keep them up to date with what we're doing be front of mind for commentary, be part of wider conversations. Then you get into an area that some organizations might forget. So people teams, you know, how do you make sure your current employees are feeling really motivated as you work with the people teams, but also your potential employees? You know, we, as much as winning business, we want to attract the best people into engine. You know, we want this to continue to be the place that people want to work. So we want our current employees to be here for as long as they get the benefit of their career. When they decide the time is right for them to move on, we want more great people to come in and join us. So our people teams are a great um, source of relationship building that's gonna continue to add to the growth of engine as an organization. And then from an operations perspective, you know, we, we want our operations teams to be able to engage with their suppliers and to give them something interesting. They're often the forgotten group. You know, they don't even get invited to the swanky events. They don't get sent the interesting content. They're probably not included in that brilliant DM campaign where you send a book out to somebody. So we make sure they're included as well. And, and so I create a matrix and, and I continue to think about that and add to it. And I've got other things in there. I can see Joe smiling. He knows I love spreadsheets and matrices. matrices. This is my life outside of being with people. So that's quite a good way. That's a good start point to think about who's going to add value to the business in its entirety, not just in a sale, because actually you make sales because your business is, is performing to its best potential. And then if we delve into one of those areas, so lead generation, um, I would then think about, right, how, how can I shape that relationship marketing program? So focus, what is it I'm trying to do? Is there a product I want to sell? Is there a service I want to promote? Um, pick a particular area and then identify the key roles that sit within that. So who's going to buy, you know, what, what's their particular job functions? Who's going to influence the decision? Who's likely to sign up a project? Who are the stakeholders? And then within each of those um, roles, I would think about what their needs are. And the key point here is this is always about the perspective of the customer challenge. It's not about our products and service at this point. It's what's the customer trying to do and how can we help them? So when we understand um, who those roles are and what their challenge is, we can then take our proposition and think about, right, what, what should we talk to them about to demonstrate we can come and help them solve a problem, solve a challenge? All relationship marketing is, and I'll keep going back to this, is a door opener. You want to start a conversation. You want to start the conversation and then you want to create opportunities to continue that conversation. And in B2B, it's often face-to-face um, -face or, or on the phone. Um, it, it's also social media. We want people to engage in our campaigns. We want people to get excited by the programs that we run. In B2C, it's the same thing, really. You know, you, you segment your market, you deliver content to them, you get them excited um, about what you're trying to do. But it's absolutely raise um, the profile of your organization, open the door, start a conversation, and then place that, your brand in the mind of, of that individual, whether it's a client or a supplier or a, or a sponsor. Um, and in terms of uh, when you've got to that, you've addressed the needs, you create an engagement plan. So what is it? How are you going to get out and speak to those people? Are you going to send them an email? Are you going to um, invite them to an event? Are you going to run a campaign that has some DM and some email as part of it? Are you going to create some um, unique content that you share with them? Are you going to do it through press coverage? Think about what it is, that route to market, that route to starting that conversation. The key point, I've made mistakes on this in the past. So when you've done all of this, make sure you tell the people internally. If you don't communicate it to, to people in the business and they get surprised by someone saying, hi, I see you're running this great offer at the moment. Yeah, of course we are. You know, frantically trying to get hold of someone to help them out. You need to tell your people first before anything hits the external world. Um, internal comms is absolutely critical to everything. And if you don't have internal comms, you don't get buy-in, which is the other thing I'll come on to in a moment. 
um, and then activate the campaign. And then I'll give you another, let's delve a little bit deeper. Um, as part of that campaign, I would then draw up a timeline of what's going to happen when. And this bit at the bottom here are the potential touch points for relationship marketing. So imagine this is a three month campaign because it is. The objective is to drive leads and a new target segment. We've got good capability in that area. We're getting great revenue, but our base is really narrow. How do we grow that customer base? We want to generate leads within that sector. Um, so as part of that campaign, we're going to have a number of touch points that individuals can use. They can send out personally that we'll push out through email campaigns. We'll use in our social comms. You know, we'll put on our website. We'll have a, some sort of flagship event in the middle. We'll basically have a number of ways to connect with existing customers for attention and new customers for lead generation. So that's a little bit of a, a, a sort of presentation of what I do. And then just one bit, bit even deeper is... If you decide that the, the sort of flagship of your campaign is an event, the same could apply if it's content, I would do another matrix. So what are the, the different ways that we take out in this example? What are the different events that we could run and which one is gonna be most suited to the campaign that I'm trying to lead? So a round table typically is about C-suite director level. They wanna exchange ideas, but you're gonna get some great content out of that. A panel discussion is often a broadcast mode, but it gives people the opportunity to ask questions. Masterclasses can demonstrate how good you are in a particular area and get you in front of a group of, of a number of people from one organization. Setting up networks like Joe's Brilliant uh, Marketing Meetup Community is a, a way of pulling people together. So I always have all these different matrices of where I could use different content routes, which I'm sure drives my team mad, but also they love it because it makes it very easy to decide what we're going to do. And then once you've decided you've got your plan in place, how are you going to make sure that it's delivering value? Track and trace, not that one. You know, I mean, we've all heard about track and trace and yet to see if it's going to work. But, uh, you know, the, we continue to cross our fingers that we won't need it. Um, but if you're going to track engagement, uh, you need to think about all of the engagement. So where... Um, what sort of things do you need to be measuring? You can have a CRM, CRM system where you can measure, you know, how many people are opening your emails, how many people are downloading content. You can capture how many people register for an event versus how many people is, attend. The long game is the interesting aspect. Some people will open up an email that invites them to an event or they download a piece of content. And then they don't get in touch with you for 18 months because they move jobs and they haven't had the opportunity to engage. And then something happens and they think, I remember somebody who did that a while ago. And they go and have a little Google or they go on LinkedIn and find somebody and they get in touch with you again. If you haven't captured that first point, you've got no way of knowing that you actually did have an influence because in my business, some of our projects take six to 12 months to come to fruition in terms of going through that, that process of bidding and submitting tenders and all of those things. So it's really important that you're somehow tagging what you're doing with individuals so that you can say, hey, marketing did that. That wasn't just a fluke. That person didn't just go and accidentally stumble across us. We did something and we continued to nurture that relationship. Um, and also uh, I mentioned about communicating to the team that example was real. Someone that we worked with in Bar that we spoke to in Barclays changed jobs and ended up somewhere completely different 18 months later and got in touch with us and said, I remember that great event you invited me to that I couldn't come to. Can I talk to you about what Engine does in this area? Well, we had that on our system. So we were able to actually, you know, validate that that was, a, was something that, that we'd done as relationship marketing. But we'd also made sure it was easy for, for our team to be able to keep track of those relationships and engage with those people. Um, so in terms of track and trace, um, use the best CRM system your business can afford. Look, we've used a really cheap one for a long time called High Rise. It costs about 150, it's American. It costs about 150 bucks a month. It's nothing fancy. We're about to move to AX because we have AX in the broader part of our business. It's gonna be much more snazzy, but I suspect less user-friendly because it's not particularly intuitive, like unlike Salesforce, but have a CRM system. Don't rely on spreadsheets. They're not, you know, I love a spreadsheet, but it's really hard to keep them up to date. And God forbid you put any of your uh, contacts email addresses in them because from a GDR perspective, that's going to just leave you in a whole heap of pain. So really good CRM system where you can capture data, segment, 
assign owners, tag against different marketing activities, set really clear APIs, uh, KPIs for each activity, consider those short and long-term goals. You know, there's, there's a real benefit of being able to demonstrate to the business that you're, you're delivering now, but be really clear that relationship marketing is about length as well as, um, as being really, you know, a quick win. If you continue to nurture some of those relationships, then the likelihood is they'll come back and you'll get something off the back of it anyway. It might not be a sale. It might be an introduction to somebody else. You know, there's lots of routes with relationship marketing. Um, be clear on what you can measure and how you're going to do it. Really interesting point. So on LinkedIn last week, um, somebody who I don't know asked a question, what's the best leadership advice you've ever been given? And a friend of mine, um, who's also a brilliant leader, he replies, you can achieve anything in life as long as you don't mind who gets the credit. What a brilliant statement, because look, you know, you're not always, you're, you may not be around when something comes to fruition. I don't mean in a really sinister way. You know, you might have moved on to a new role, um, but if, you, if you're really committed to doing the best job possible, the long game is that someone else might take the credit for that. That's fine. You know, you, you know that you did the work. You don't need somebody else to say, you know, brilliant, you did that. So start a conversation now, but sometimes you're not going to see the fruition of that. I don't know how many of you work in agile ways, but for us, that's absolutely key. Constantly reviewing, having regular stand-ups where we talk about where the campaigns are going, where our programs are going, and what do we need to tweak, what do we need to change. And thinking about Matthew Syed, who's going to talk about diverse thinking tomorrow, try and bring in different people into your planning stages. Oh, look, we all want an easy life, don't we? We want to sit with a group of people who go, this is brilliant. Yeah, this is absolutely the right thing to do. But from friction comes innovation and from innovation comes attention. So if you can do something that feels hard, i.e. ask someone who you know is going to say that's rubbish and it's rubbish because the reality is you're probably going to get something better off the back of it. It feels hard at the time, but if you're prepared to listen to a different perspective rather than just get that warm glow of, aren't you brilliant, Emma? Look at this campaign you've done. I guarantee you'll, you'll, you'll get more reward off the back of it. And then a couple of examples, because it's always useful to think about who's doing it well. Um, I mean, I love Patagonia. They're just one of my favorite um, brands, and I'm sure they're a favorite brand of lots of people here. Um, the reason I think they do this well is because they set, um, I'm, I, I'm not a big fan of the word purpose, but they actually do have a purpose. They want to do good in the world. 1% of their profits goes to, you know, um, uh, planet community I think it's called which is invests in all different um, projects they allow their people times uh, time off to go and um, do some sort of activism they'll even train them and give them advice on uh, how, how to get legal advice if something goes wrong when you're basically protesting against something that you passionately believe in and um, but they, they they set themselves up in a really strong way of look we're all about the environment we're all about being eco-friendly we want you to buy um, used clothing if possible. We want everything to have as long a life as possible. And guess what? They're making a lot of money off the back of it because people don't feel like they're out there to rip them off. And if you don't know what that program is, vote the assholes out or assholes because it's American. Go and, go and have a look at it. It's utterly brilliant. It was a design team who changed the, the little tag and just put them in trousers. And it was all about getting politicians out who weren't doing a particularly good job. But they didn't even ask permission. They just did it. Um, and then from a, a B2B perspective, this is a really small one. And, and my point here is that it doesn't always have to be a big brand. The influencer is a small organization that, that helps um, brands to build meaningful relationships with influencers. Um, and they do a really great job. They deliver this brilliant email, which is really targeted, really personalized, and it curates the content in a great way. Here's some stuff that we know was too long and you wouldn't read it. We're going to digest it for you. Here's a, a few sound bites. This is what's going on with consumers. This is what's going on with brands. Here's some of the campaigns we've delivered. That Pantem one, The Power of Grey, is genius it's just such a clever idea when we're seeing this shift from you know um, body representation that is unrealistic into realistic uh, models so influencer is a big one for me I think they do brilliant work and and I continue to be impressed by what they do and then um, just to wrap up before we get into Q&A um, what I've learned along the way a lot you know, I honestly, I never stop learning. Um, sometimes it's about tech, which I 
both love and hate in equal measure. And, and I really just want to sit down with people who develop the platforms we use and say, please use, get some user experience because it's so rubbish. But um, the key things are make sure you identify the purpose of the relationships. As I said, be broad. Where are you going to get value in your business? You will make sales if you think about the business end to end, not just sales and marketing. Um, get buy in. You know, who's your stakeholder? Who's going to champion you at board level? Who's going to make sure you get budget? Who's going to make sure the sales team actually engage with the content you create? Who's going to make sure the social media team are pu pushing your content out of your social media channels? Um, it's with, it's not at. Work in partnership with those groups. Um, culture drives adoption. So, you know, make sure the culture of your organization is right. So if you're going to use a system, the system is almost second place. You have to show people why this is going to change the way we work, not how. Um, be creative. You know, I, I do think that diverse thinking. Repl replicable processes are good. I love a process, but variety adds texture. And if you bring in that different thinking and you get people in who you know are going to challenge you and say, that was good, Emma, but you could have done better if you'd done this, you'll be better as a, a result and so will the business. Communicate to everybody. No one wants to feel left out. No one wants to see a campaign go out and not be aware of what it is. Everybody's an, an ambassador for the business, so make sure they're kept up to date. And make sure you play the long game as well as the short game, forget the glory. You know, this is about doing a great job and making sure that the business achieves its objectives. And finally, enjoy it. Oh my God, if you get to work in relationship marketing, I guarantee you will have this space most of the time. You'll also be tearing your hair out a lot of the time, but you will love it. So enjoy it. It's a brilliant job. It's a brilliant part of the job if your job is more rounded in terms of marketing. Um, but yeah, that's kind of a whistle stop tour of relationship marketing from me. <laughs> I love it. Thank you so much, Emma. I really, really appreciate that. And, and uh, Kelsey has already said that she has that face on her right now. Oh, that's <laughs> nice. <laughs> I often have this face on. That's why I've got so many lines. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I love it and there's actually some really great thoughtful questions that have come through in the Q&A as well which we can dig our teeth into shall so, I stop the share yeah 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 let's let's see uh your face <laughs> <laughs> so oh, thank uh, you everybody lovely oh uh, Kelsey that's nice <laughs> really nice I mean it's, it's it's genuinely appreciated everyone when, when people take the time to say thank you um yeah it is in whatever way it, it just it, it really makes such a difference and it is one of the differences of this community as well especially when you're presenting I think in yeah. this world it can feel like you're in a bit of a black hole sometimes. yeah absolutely and look I, you know there's so much I could have put in there it's so hard to I mean I've got, I could talk for weeks about <laughs> relationship marketing I could talk for, for weeks just about segmenting your audience <laughs> but you know nobody wants to hear that really do they it's just me <laughs> but I, I, don't know, I think there's 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 a lot in it so let's let's get into the questions and okay i am interested in stuff like crm and segmentation because like we don't actually touch on that a lot either um, yeah i have no idea about crm stuff so i'm going to be coming to you go for it <laughs> uh, let's start with some questions from the community first because uh because do we, i need to go in or are you going to keep, uh, are you gonna I'll, uh, I'll ask the questions so amazing you, uh so the first one for jemima um asks uh when doing these process maps slash diagrams uh do you have any great tools that you, you can use uh when to, when you do these it looked like they were made in excel and it was a yeah i mean i i joe knows me very well i <laughs> look there's loads of templates out on on um the on website so if you google you'll find some really good templates that's a really good start point, but try not to be constrained by what other people do. I mean, you're, you obviously you'll get um, the recording of this, so you'll be able to reuse what I've done. But I like to use it from, I like to create them myself because I'm thinking then about where I am currently in an organization and what's relevant to us. And when I use other people's templates, I can really quickly be um, diverted into something that isn't quite right for me. So it's good to go and have a look online and see who's doing what, but then sit down, get a group of people together and start asking those questions. What is it we're trying to achieve? Do you know the other great thing about doing that? is um, we, we as marketers have the right to go and ask questions about the strategy of a business. Whereas mm -hmm. lots of people in, in the business, they don't, they don't even think to do it. We, you know, we're there, we're trying to deliver 
that business strategy for an organization. So go and ask questions and create something that feels very personal to you because relationship marketing is only authentic if it's about your business. So by all means, use what I've shared, you know, help yourself. Mm. You're always welcome to use uh, any of my templates. <laughs> I think we actually had a template from your last talk. As well. You did. Uh, it might have been the production schedule, which I still <laughs> use to this day. I'm yeah, using it tomorrow. <laughs> ridiculous. So for anyone that would like uh, to know how to produce an event that actually rocks, uh, you, you need to go uh, find out and seek out that, that previous uh, blog post. From, from minute there. by minute. Oh, it's ridiculous. <laughs> Absolutely ridiculous. Um, so I, I love this question from Dan, actually. Uh, and Dan says, uh, could relationship marketing be the central driving method behind all marketing and content activity for a smaller team? Uh, so it's just him. It's just himself. Uh, yeah. It's just myself and uh, his often vacant manager. So, uh, <laughs> you mean vacant as in not there, not vacant as in I, I, not I there. <laughs> So building relationships is being prioritized above else, all else. Uh, could this survive by itself? And I, I think this speaks to, you know, where does relationship marketing fit in a broader marketing context? Yeah, so I think when you're part of a bit, like, so look, look, let's be honest, I work for an organization that, uh, you know, it's a multi-million pound turnover. It's big business. Uh, I am a team of one in relationship marketing. However, I have a team around the business. And in many ways that works much better than us being a, a team sitting in a central marketing function where we're a, an interconnected group of people and we're fluid depending on what we're trying to deliver. But when I was head of marketing for the pillar that I mentioned at the beginning, I didn't realize that basically my approach was relationship marketing. I was just doing it. I was thinking, what do we need to achieve? We need to retain our current business as much as possible there's always churn and that's fine because we wouldn't win business if there wasn't churn so let's be realistic um so i was i was always thinking about how can i go out and engage with people um therefore what's the program that i put in place and an end-to-end marketing program in many ways is a relationship marketing program because as a start point which is here's my strategy and the end point is this is what we want to deliver Mm -hmm. So I think you could absolutely create a relationship marketing plan, which is an effective marketing plan. Absolutely. And, and how, do, how do you tend to use? So, for example, uh, we were speaking before we went live about sort of having a campaign approach to these, these big spikes yeah. and stuff like that. So I, I thought this was really useful, actually, as a thought, because I know that when I engage in marketing, doing our events and stuff like that, I, I'm guilty of creating big spikes of activity and then and then it's gone yeah you know? and and this both loops into uh, creating campaigns but it also loops into like stuff like crms and stuff like yeah. that yeah yeah you know how do you sort of approach that from a relationship marketing perspective taking so i create a campaign plan you know yeah. and relationship marketing is part of that but i go back to basics of What's my start point? What's my end point? Mm -hmm. The spike is often the big part in the middle, but you should have a number of spikes either side of that. And it might, it's probably not external spikes, you know, pre, um, pre the central activity, whether that's the publication of a report or it's an event or it's a, you know, a social media um, campaign that you're going to run for a, a period of time. Um, you'll be teasing before it happens and you'll be sharing content, you'll be basing creating demand and then post the activity with the biggest spike, you're then doing follow-up. So you think about, right, what's, what do we want to do afterwards? We send the email, we say, thank you. And then we break the content down into you know, repurposable content is, is the lifeblood of any marketing team, especially a small one. How do you make the most of content when you don't have big budgets to be continually producing new content all of the time is you break it into chunks and you think about your audiences again and how you're going to push it out to them. And that's a campaign. It's that you came to us for that event. We've now thought about your business. We've taken five minutes from that talk that you watched. We think this is the most, I've done this before. We think this is the most important five minutes. How about we come in and sit with your team? We watch that. And then we talk about what that could mean for your business. So it's continually thinking, how can I add value to that customer relationship or that supplier relationship or that sponsor relationship throughout the journey of the campaign? And I think you said a, an interesting word there, which was thinking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and we don't always have time for that, do we? But we need it. That's, that's going to be precisely the point that I was, I was going to say. You know, I 
can speak for myself and I'm sure that you know there's 190 people watching right now who have carved out an hour of their day yeah. to, to watch to learn to chat and stuff like that but how do you time take time to think you know and, and and what do you do you have a conscious sort of like strategy point where at the beginning of every campaign you'll actually take a day to actually plan it out so I feel guilty of always just doing. If I yeah, so I do. I'm, I, I do make sure that I plan, you know, I, I will. And I'll, I'll have different texts around me that I can draw upon. So if I'm, I want to do something around customer experience, I've got a great book that I've, I've scribbled in over the years. And it just reminds me, don't forget to do that. Don't forget to think about this. So I'll carve out time. Um, we, the, we use um, 365 in, in engine and I get my daily email from Cortana that says, would you like to protect some time in your day? Mm. I always say yes and mm. basically block it out because uh, you know, this Zoom world, mm. if I don't do that, people go and put my diary up. They don't even leave me a lunch break. It's like, mm. I can't, I can't function. I need to have headspace. And one of the great things I'm finding about um, working from home is that I actually go and have a walk. So I'll just go and if I've got something I'm mulling over, I'll just go out for half an hour and mull it over away from my desk. And that's just finding that invaluable. But yeah, you've got, honestly, it feels like a luxury. It's not, you know, make that space. And if you can, going back to that diverse thinking, bring in some other people to help you shape it because yeah, on, I can't recommend that book enough. Individuals on their own cannot solve complex problems. You have to do it as a community of people. If you want to solve complex problems, don't sit in isolation at your desk. Yeah. Speak to other people. Thank you for that. I think there's a lot of people who probably take, you know, I mean, that's a nice challenge for the marketing meetup community as much as anything. You know, we should probably be looking to solve more problems, you know, for, for other people. But, you know, uh, yeah. so, uh, that's a really useful thought. I think in this world, it can feel quite isolating. And yeah. actually, to that point, um, how has relationship marketing changed over this past year? Because yeah you know you're going from a world where you presumably could have attended a lot of events mm. and you hear a lot of salespeople speak about this right now you know oh i used to go to an expo or i used to go to an event yeah. uh i used to meet people and then you know would find out leads and stuff like that yeah have you found yourself doing stuff like more cold outreach to people and, and stuff like that so i do so i do that anyway and i don't think it's cold by the way i yes. think um the the reason we've thought of it as cold is because we've got this historic um, reference of cold calling of people sitting with you know a list and, and a script that tells them you have to phone this person and and within five minutes you've got to have told them what our proposition is and how we're going to help them I go through LinkedIn every couple of weeks I'll just do a little you know smurf around literally and go <laughs> right what's going on um, and just connect with a couple of people and, and have a conversation and we've just actually set up um, not me I mean we within engine one of the brilliant people in our team Stacy has set up a business development network to encourage more people to think about doing that so relationship marketing going back to what I said at the beginning is not just about salespeople. We've all got the capacity to build these great relationships. And actually this community, you know, we, we connect with other people. I've had some really interesting meetings off the back of the two talks I've done for you in the past where I've been able to almost become a mentor for somebody who is starting out in their career, somebody who worked for Cancer Research UK and actually go in and help them think about approaching what they do in a different way. So try not to think of it as cold, try to think of it as who could I connect with and why? Because mm -hmm. if you've got a value to add to that, oh my, the number of people who connect with you on LinkedIn with a sale straight yeah. away, I'm sorry, don't do that. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're interested in me, a, a bit like dating, get to know me first and then a relationship might come out of it. You don't, you know, arrive on your first date and go, hi, would you like to get married? <laughs> Which is kind of what it feels like a lot of the time. So it is, it's all about understanding someone and, and only connecting with people who are going to have a reason to want to be connected with you. So I, I, I love that because, you know, you're right. It, it does feel like that a lot of the time. And, and sometimes you do want to connect with people just because they're interesting, you know, yeah. I just have that 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 chat now yeah. look because look do you remember i told you about i um mark ritson mm -hmm. absolute fangirl been a yeah. fangirl for years and he, i knew he was going to be at the festival of marketing two years ago the very last one that we could attend and uh, i just dropped him a note and said can i do a podcast with you for mm -hmm. engine mm -hmm. and he was like oh i love engine go on then and yeah. i was like oh 
my goodness but I you know I, I mean obviously I put some other stuff in there as well but it there was a reason for me to connect with him I had an audience that he could reach out to but equally I he knew straight away that he was going to get a really exciting conversation because I'm very excitable so <laughs> <laughs> It's super important though. And I think that's the thing that, you know, someone like Mark um, would appear absolutely inaccessible for mm. most people. But I think most folks will be really surprised mm. how, how open to conversations people are if they're the right conversations that sort of feel like they're mutually beneficial. Yeah. You know, I remember when you were looking for people for um, marketing mm. meetup last year and I sent him a message and said, Go, you should check these out. I think a few other people did as well. Mm. And he obviously liked what you were doing. He came <laughs> and spoke to you. I mean, he's just brilliant, isn't he? Oh, it's phenomenal. <laughs> he's doing so, you know, the, the uh, mini MBA seems like it's absolutely flying. So Yeah, um, I've done that. It's very good if you get the I chance. Think, yeah, get the September. chance to do it. It's great. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, I think I'm doing it in September as well. So, you know, that's a uh, go do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so let's take a, a question from Katie here. Uh, Katie asks, uh, how do you balance the reactive versus strategic in terms of relationship marketing? Uh, in addition, how do you ensure when you're being reactive that an organization you, you, you're in can be agile and make decisions quickly on their activities? And this might be interesting for you because, of course, you spend, you had, you're, you're the process person, right? So yeah. when you get these new opportunities come through in the relationship marketing context, how do yeah. you yeah, so, I mean, look, um, you've got to set a strategy. This comes back to Agile, obviously. You've got to, it's not free, by the way. Where's the mini MBA? I think it's about £1,200. So, yeah. <laughs> but, they do, but they do competitions as well. So look out for them because they'll do, you know, there'll be a presentation. I'll come back to your question, Joe. There'll be a presentation. And if you reply with an interesting insight, you can, you can win a place. So it's always worth checking that out. Um, yeah, so a strategic, uh, as Marcus says, we should always be looking at that balance. And if you are, if you develop a strategy, naturally within that are your tactical reactive elements. You know, that there should always be headspace for um, look, the pandemic happened. Nobody saw that coming. You know, even in those few months when we were getting all the news, we were like, yeah, oh, we've all seen contagion and an outbreak. That's never going to happen in our lifetime. <laughs> um, but when something does happen, you find the space to actually um, think and react in that way. And you just change a bit of your strategy off the back of that. And reactive things are very good for making you reflect on is the strategy the right strategy? Because you can't look five year strategy is is unrealistic. You know, you should be thinking, yeah, we want our brand to be still present in five years. But you've got to have a strategy that allows you to adapt along the way. So having those regular get togethers, um, making sure that um, somebody's tracking what's going on uh, in the industry or with your clients so that you can react to that. You know, things happen in your own organization where you have to do something different. So I, I think it just becomes a part of your day to day is yeah. that you've got an overall plan, but you're that, thinking about smaller that, things. I think that can be underestimated there that you sort of said you include that as part of your stand-ups and like it, that, that, that communication. And that was also something that was really interesting was the internal communication. Yeah. We all miss that. As, as oh, seriously. And it happens so often. I've just done a piece of work for, so I work four days a week for Engine. And on my fifth day, I will go and help out um, companies who are basically either struggling or looking for, to with, have really ambitious growth plans. And I worked with a company that, you know, they're really uh, environmental. They're doing incredible things. They've just become um, carbon neutral, three years ahead of their target. Incredible work. Their internal comms is absolutely pants. Nobody knows who's doing what, when it's happening. That was the first point. It's like, get your internal comms right. Have a strategy. Have a plan that shows what you're going to tell people and when. You know, make sure you capture all those key dates that happen through the year. So you're being, you know, you're reflecting the diversity of your organization you know it's it's a it's a key part of of any job is internal comms and it becomes like you know secondary because it's and that's why relationship marketing I think is good is because you're holistic who are all of those stakeholders people team is always in there for me how do we talk to current employees how do we think about recruitment oh, that, yeah it's, it's so so important and you made a point in the talk that it's not just about like the um 
the uh, the c-suite you know it's about more yeah. people you know and, and when you use the language of relationship marketing and stuff like that do you include stuff like uh quote unquote decision makers and and you know sort of gatekeepers and stuff yeah like we do and get you know i've done programs for um pas because mm-hmm. look the pa is the person who's going to get me through the door of you know the decision maker or the c-suite member that i want to come along and talk at an event or be on a panel or sit at a round table um the other thing as well is c-suite people eventually retire (laughs) so if you're not nurturing that whole bank of people who are rising up through the ranks if you're not basically you know one of the things i love about my job we talked about this before we started is the ability to make heroes of people if we can give something to the people we work with and make them a hero in their organization Mm -hmm. the goodwill you get off that is enormous so you think about everybody and how you know what's their trajectory how can they help you how can you help them you know it becomes it actually just makes life more enjoyable we're at work such a, a significant part of our week good to make it a bit of fun and rewarding absolutely I, I, I used to have exactly the same thought process in that I used to visualize someone sat at their desk doing like a little fist bump moment you yeah know? <laughs> absolutely no seriously and no, I you know and I mean it when I say about the sharing some of those hints and tips take them back in and you don't even have to give credit just say I've got this great idea go and be a hero in your business you know we, we're, we're a cost <laughs> to our businesses we have to demonstrate value and go and do it <laughs> Um, so I don't know how quick an answer this one will be. Okay. Uh, Dan, who says, uh, are there any budget-friendly CRM suggestions, you, uh, systems you'd suggest? Uh, so he struggled to push for it to go through. So you mentioned. So we use yeah we use High Rise at the moment, but look, High Rise is not supported. Uh, it's supported in that if you're if you're using it, um, you know if you've got a problem, you can go to to the company that built it. It was built by Basecamp, and that's one of the reasons we liked it. It's because it's from a developer community so it was quite user friendly um but the, there you go someone's people are already sharing um small business crm there's quite a few you know again if you google um low, low cost crm systems have just have a list of the things that are really important to you can it capture data can you segment what's the reporting like the worst thing about high rise is a single hubspot is very good um it's a single download of a spreadsheet i mean i'm great with spreadsheets but it's not user-friendly in any way. So think about what data do you want to capture? How do you want to manipulate it? What do you want to save to the system? And how do you want to use reporting? Loads of them out there. Yeah, Zoho is pretty good as well. It'll be interesting to uh, pop a discussion about that in in the Facebook group as well. Yeah. What yeah. Sound that because uh, yeah, I'm in the market as well. So uh, I'm I'm curious. Pipe pipe drive another (laughs) one that is good. Yeah. Yeah, That's some good one. You're getting lots of advice on there. <laughs> there's there's one uh, here from Jemima which I think is really interesting. And Jemima asks, uh, I'm looking into our customer onboarding process and how we can build relationships at that particular stage. So uh, a purchase and reten- retention sort of play, I- I'd guess. Uh, how do you suggest that they map out the touch points and what process should she, she take to do that? So um, we spoke about moving away from templates. Um, yeah. How do you then actually go and do that? Yeah, so our, I mean, we, we do this in our onboarding. So if you're thinking about onboarding a customer, what are the, where are the points you can add value is the first thing. So what do you, you need to, you're almost creating a journey, aren't you? When that customer joins you, what's the journey that happens? Um, and where are the, the opportunities for you to surprise and delight that individual? So I would do things like, okay, we've just, say we've just signed a, a new government department and government's interesting because you can't spend money on them. You have to think about things that are, are low cost. I'd be looking at, right, what can I do with the key stakeholder, the person who signed the contract? Well, I need to continually show them they've made the right decision. They need to feel reassured. This was absolutely the right decision. They need to be sent content that continually shows them where we add value, but also opens up their eyes to how they can continue to improve what they're doing internally. But I would also be thinking, what can I do for their broader organization? So can I run a masterclass for the people within his or her team that, that demonstrates what we're doing for them as a business and how they're going to utilize it how do we upskill them so I'd be looking at what are the various points of that that relationship from um, I'll, I'll come something really quickly before we finish as well what are the various things we can do at that point 
um, that's going to a surprise and delight, but also reassure them that they've made the right decision. And the point I want to make is don't forget when they leave we're really rubbish at endings. Now things end and they don't end always because of friction. They end because there's just a natural um, conclusion to the journey we've been on together. There's a really good book. I think it's called Ends, uh, E-N-D-S. Um, and it was written by um, a consultant who's based in Manchester. And he talks about the fact that, you know, if you end something really well, think about a relationship that you ended well, you know, A, you feel closure, you feel content, you feel happy with the experience, but B, you've not closed the door, you know, you've maintained something off the back of that. If you end a business relationship well, you leave a door open for the future. So onboarding, absolutely also think about offboarding. I love that. And, and that, was the, that was the quote from the talk, that relationship marketing <laughs> is the door opener. Yes. It absolutely is. <laughs> it's fabulous. It's, it's a bad moment to start choking. So, uh, <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> uh, Emma, that, that was sensational. Thank you for taking the time. Oh, out. thank you for having me. I love it. I'm always <laughs> a little bit anxious that I'm not going to be able to give you enough. So it's it's just so lovely to be invited back. <laughs> well, no, not at all. We'll, we'll, um, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll include your LinkedIn profile in, in the follow-up email. So. Yeah, please connect. <laughs> Lovely. Well, at least you got permission. Now. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, so thank you everyone for taking the time to, to watch oh. in today. Honestly, um, just so, so lucky to have this community. Um, Amazing. Thank you, Joe, for pulling it together. I'm sure we don't tell you that often enough. Oh, it's good fun. I, I, I feel very, very lucky. Um, but, you know, uh, please do say thank you to the sponsors uh, for, for allowing us to continue doing what we're doing today. And do check out uh, Third Light as well in particular. So um, I think it's Michael that's linked up in the follow-up email to this okay. uh, for today. Go and say hi to Michael. It's so lovely. He made he sent me an email last year that made me cry when oh. we were in mid pandemic. He was just so supportive. Uh, thank you, Louise, for putting your capital letters in. Yes, we love you, Joe. <laughs> we do. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, no. Take the time to connect with Emma. To connect with one another. Join the Facebook group. Say thank you to the sponsors. Please come back next week. We're at an afternoon session next week as well. Uh, so thank you all so much for uh, turning up at, at the time change as well I, I hope that it sort of propels you through the rest of your day have a lovely one thank you emma thank and, you uh, we'll see you soon see you soon emma. bye